Because I can't shut up about digestion, I end up getting a lot of questions about pepsin. So in this video, I just want to explain what pepsin is, what its uses are, and things you might want to think about if you're considering supplementing with pepsin. Let's jump in. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So pepsin is an enzyme that is made in the stomach and I've talked in other videos about how its primary function is to help us digest protein and break down proteins into amino acids. And this is a really big deal because the main building blocks for the whole body and all the tissues and all these organs and all these things that have to be rebuilt and repaired, one of the main building blocks is amino acids. And we access amino acids by breaking proteins down. So the body can't really do anything with protein. It can't do anything with chicken. It's gotta break that chicken down into amino acids. And pepsin is a really big player. So this becomes a very important aspect of our whole physiology and our whole digestive process, we need to be able to take protein and turn that into building blocks that the body can use. In a lot of cases when someone can't break down proteins into amino acids, the body's like, hey, and I'm gonna get them anyways, and it'll break down our own tissues and turn those into amino acids, and a person will just start swiveling and wibbling away until they're almost nothing. So this breakdown of protein into amino acids is a big deal. So when we dig into understanding this pepsin a little bit, let's look at this paper over on the National Library of Medicine website on the physiology of pepsin. And I'll put a link in the description below this video so you can dig into this paper a little bit and some other papers that we'll talk about in this video as well. But on this paper, they're talking about how there's two forms of digestion, really. There's the mechanical form and then the chemical form. And with the mechanical form, they're talking about, hey, we gotta chew things up. Hey, we're mixing all this stuff with it. And then the stomach actually does some churning of things. All these are mechanical steps that help us break these foods down into smaller particles. So then the chemical part of digestion is more effective. And they say the chemical digestion is the enzymatic cleavage of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats into tiny amino acids, sugars, and fatty acids. So this is where we're really breaking our food down so that we can access the nutrients in that food. And a lot of people that'll come to me with issues, with problems, with all these, like, oh, I have all these emotional issues and all these other health issues that are not really digestive symptoms, a lot of times they have to do with nutrient deficiencies that are coming from digestive malfunctions because the person can't really break down their food in a way that allows them to access all the nutrients in that food. And when we can't access the nutrients in our food, there's going to be a lack of resources and nutrients that the body has available, and that's gonna create a wide variety of issues. So this paper explains to us how important the stomach is in this digestive process, because not only does it do that churning kind of action, but it helps create these gastric juices that help us really break down that food. And it says gastric juices comprises of water, mucus, hydrochloric acid, pepsin, and intrinsic factor. Of these five components, Pepsin is the principal enzyme involved in protein digestion. So that becomes very important. This pepsin is a very big deal. Without it, it's harder for us to break down protein. We'll talk about some other ways we can break down protein in a second, but the most effective way for us to break down protein is with this pepsin enzyme in the stomach. So they say that specific cells within the gastric lining, known as chief cells, release pepsin in an inactive form or zymogen form called pepsinogen. So this is releasing this pepsinogen into the stomach when we're consuming foods. They go on to say, by doing so, the stomach prevents the auto-digestion of protective proteins in the lining of the digestive tract. Since chief cells release pepsin as zymogen, activation of an acidic environment is necessary. Hydrochloric acid, or HCl, another component of gastric juice, plays a crucial role in creating the pH required for pepsin activity. So this helps us understand that the body doesn't just put out pepsin because then the pepsin would digest the lining of the stomach and that would not be a good plan. So it puts out this pepsinogen in an inactive form and then once it's in an acidic environment that comes about from the hydrochloric acid that the stomach generates, now the pepsin is activated. 
now it can really start to break down these proteins. So it's not just about having the pepsin, it's about having that acidic environment from the hydrochloric acid is really what helps us break down our protein. So when we're looking at this digestive process a little bit, when the food comes in and comes down to the stomach, and that's when the stomach starts to generate this hydrochloric acid and all this pepsin and all these things that help us in that gastric juices to really break down that food. But we can see that with those gastric juices and the hydrochloric acid being very important, paper also says that a pH between 1.5 and 2, which is really acidic, we're talking battery acid type acidic here, in that type of pH level, the pepsin is most effective. So this helps us understand why a lot of people don't have the ability to break down proteins well, because not only are they not making enough stomach acid, which is very common for a wide variety of reasons, but some people also will have like a bacterial overgrowth in the stomach, and that bacterial overgrowth is putting out these byproducts that are alkaline and neutralizing maybe the small amount of acid that a person is making. So now that acid in the stomach is not getting down to this pH between 1.5 and 2, which means that the pepsin is not going to be as active. It may be some active, but it might not be as active if we were able to bring that pH down. And that's why a lot of people find so much success improving a wide variety of health issues once they can remove a bacterial overgrowth in the stomach or the small intestine here where it really shouldn't be in either place that's going to disrupt the digestive process. But we find that people improve a wide variety of health issues once they can really acidify their stomach so that they can turn those proteins into the amino acids that the body really needs. Now there are other enzymes that have the ability to help us break down proteins and a lot of those are made in the pancreas and they come down here into the duodenum once the food leaves the stomach. And there are other pancreatic enzymes that can help us break down protein. They just are not as effective as pepsin. But a lot of the medical world looks at it like, eh, if a person doesn't have pepsin, it's no big deal. There's other enzymes that'll help. But a lot of times when the pepsin is not active, it's because there's not enough stomach acid to activate it which means that there's not enough stomach acid to really start that breakdown process. So any enzymes that are going to help us do this breakdown further down, like from the pancreas, are not going to be able to break the food down as well because remember, we need that mechanical part of digestion where things get broken down into smaller particles. So another problem is that in this duodenum here, it's, it's a hormone called cholecystokinin that kind of gets triggered once stomach acid comes into the duodenum. And that cholecystokinin tells the gallbladder to drop alkaline bile down, but it's also what tells that pancreas to say, hey, squirt out some bicarb to help the bile neutralize the acids leaving the stomach, but also put, put out those enzymes to help us break down all these proteins and carbohydrates and fats. So that's why those enzymes are important, but a lot of times they're being triggered by stomach acid leaving the stomach. That's what really kicks off that cholecystokinin. Now dietary fats can trigger cholecystokinin a little bit as well, and so can amino acids, but remember we need the protein to be broken down into amino acids with the stomach acid and the pepsin. So you can see that a lot of malfunctions can happen when there's not enough stomach acid there. And because these amino acid needs can be so great in the body, breaking down our protein is a really big deal. And this paper that I'm linking below also goes into how pepsin can be a factor when it comes to silent reflux and LPR type symptoms, where somebody's having symptoms up here, like in the larynx and the vocal cords. And this is part of what I dealt with. You know, 23 different doctors were trying to help me get my voice back, and a lot of them would turn off stomach acid, but it wouldn't improve because I still had all these enzymes that were coming up and still breaking down those tissues and creating inflammation for all of my vocal cord action. So this paper talks a lot about how pepsin can be involved in that process because it has the ability to break down protein. If it's coming back up here and it gets into any kind of acidified pH, then it's going to be activated and start breaking down those tissues as well. But this is not the reason that we don't supplement with pepsin. We'll talk about that in a second, but it's something to understand at least why someone might have this problem with their vocal cords or having a chronic cough or I'm always clearing my throat type issue when they've turned off stomach acid and there's no acid coming back up. They don't feel heartburn, but there can be these enzymes that can come back up and create damage. And if you're having issues with LPR type issues, I'm not going to go all the way into that right now, but we'll put a link in the description below for our video on four steps for silent reflux so you can dig into that if you need to. 
But the thing to understand is that there's a wide variety of reasons that someone may not be making enough stomach acid. Somebody doesn't need to be turning off stomach acid on purpose, like millions of people do every day. There's a lot of reasons that someone might not be able to make enough. And when we look at this paper, they also go into a little bit, they say that notably acetylcholine, gastrin, and low pH directly stimulate chief cells to secrete pepsinogen. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter released from vagal parasympathetic nerve terminals in the cephalic phase of food digestion. And so this is part of where the body kind of has to move into this parasympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system, which is our rest and digest side. But a lot of people are either so stressed in their life or there's so much stress in their body that they're kind of stuck in that sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system. So it can make it harder for them to move into that parasympathetic state where the body can really generate these gastric juices that are needed to break down our food correctly. So here's what's important to understand about pepsin. We hear from a lot of people who have success improving a wide variety of digestive symptoms by supplementing with betaine HCL capsules. And betaine HCL is just a supplemental form of the HCL that your body would make on its own. And if your body's not making enough, a person can supplement with this HCL and then they can find improvement. But you really want to know how to do it. If somebody's supplementing with HCL incorrectly, they really have the ability to magnify a lot of symptoms instead of improve them. So if you don't know how to use that yet, um, my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, chapters three and four, kind of walk you through figuring out which aspects of digestion are not working correctly and how to correct those. And it really goes over how to use HCL the right way. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put a link in the description below where you can get the whole thing totally for free. And then you can just jump to chapters three and four and it'll kind of walk you through how to use HCL the right way. But here's the thing, pretty much any HCL that is produced out in the world almost always contains pepsin because pepsin is an important part of breaking down that protein. If somebody's supplementing with HCL, the manufacturer's like, oh, we should give them some pepsin too. That's gonna help them digest their food better. And it really can. The problem is a lot of people need to work up to a slightly higher dose of HCL, like maybe five capsules per meal. And I'm not telling you to use five capsules per meal. I'm just saying we hear from a lot of people that have success doing this. But if a person is using an HCL that contains pepsin and they take five capsules, that's a lot of pepsin. And remember that the body is usually going to be making pepsin on its own. So when it's making pepsin, once that environment is acidified and it really gets activated, now you have the pepsin that your body is being triggered to make, plus all this pepsin you put in there, and it's going to create a lot of digestive discomfort for a lot of people. Not everybody, but we see that more than half of the people experience discomfort. And I'll put a link to a paper below that kind of walks through this and why this happens with too much pepsin, but this is why we supplement with HCL without pepsin. Now, if somebody already has some HCL with pepsin, they could take one of those capsules that contains pepsin, but if they need more than one HCL capsule per meal, they should probably use another form of HCL that does not contain pepsin. So giving your body a little bit of a boost of pepsin, like one capsule, is usually gonna be fine. It's gonna be okay. Maybe you even help yourself digest that protein better. But when you start going to a higher level, it creates a lot of discomfort. So I'll put a link in the description below to the HCL that we use that does not contain pepsin. I'm not saying that you need to use that, but I know you're going to ask. So I'll just put a link so you can kind of see the ingredients and understand what you're looking for. But using one capsule with pepsin may be okay, but we like to use one generally without pepsin. And we don't feel like you need to use one with pepsin because the body is making pepsin on its own. It's just not being activated because that stomach is not acidified. Either because the person is not producing enough HCL or maybe there's some type of overgrowth that is creating some type of uh, neutralization of the acids that you are creating. And as far as looking at other enzymes to use, that may be beneficial for some people who are really having a hard time. Maybe they can't acidify their food because there's not enough acid in the stomach and then there's not enough acid leaving the stomach and going into the duodenum and triggering the pancreas to release all these enzymes. So sometimes supplementing with some enzymes can help. We have other videos that go more into digestive enzymes and the one we use is called Digestazyme from Empirical Labs. And we use that because it has some other ingredients like cofactors that the body needs to be able to make more of its own HCL. And that seems to reduce 
the length of time that someone might need to supplement with these betaine HCL capsules and that can help them get off of that sooner and allow the body to just start working the way that it's supposed to work anyways. But again, I don't feel like using digestive enzymes is really helping the body break down protein as well as stomach acid and activated pepsin would in the stomach. So acidifying that stomach is really the more important factor. So I hope that helps you understand all the benefits that can come from pepsin, but also why we don't supplement with pepsin. Now, if you feel like your body is not making enough HCL on its own, you can jump over right now and check out our video on why can't my body make HCL. I can't wait to hear about your results.